Welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. Coming up on September 9th and 10th is the 15th annual Astronomy at the Beach. With me here in the studio is John Schroer. We're going to talk about this upcoming event, but before we do that, we're going to show you some footage from last year's program. Take a look. The Great Lakes Association of Astronomy Clubs work with many sponsors to host our 14th annual Astronomy at the Beach. This short video clip will focus primarily on the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club's Beachside Astronomers. This year's Astronomy at the Beach featured a number of tables from vendors, Wayne State University, and many astronomy clubs. The camera mark table had quite a few telescopes on display. As we approached Maple Beach, we could see astronomers setting up their telescopes for evening viewing. Yellow balloons mark telescopes that could safely view the sun. Here's Doug Bauer, back president, setting up his bead telescope. Nearby others were already viewing the sun through their personal solar telescopes. Oh, it's on too well, okay. Here, let me loosen it. So you got a PST and a Vixen mount here? And a Vixen Sphinx SXW mount. And the mount's rated for 30 pounds. 30, yeah, 30. Uh, you can put more on it, but uh -huh. you get a little bit of wind and... Hi. What do, what do these mounts run, roughly? Uh, they're about uh, two grand new, but uh, I bought this used for about uh, twelve. Oh, okay. Twelve hundred, not twelve thousand. Twelve hundred. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Very cool. Here's Steve Harbath standing near his Takahashi six-inch refractor. This telescope gives great views, and there's always a long line of visitors waiting to take a look through it. Members from other clubs brought their telescopes as well. Here we see a large reflector telescope with a 20-inch mirror. This 8-inch home-built Dobsonian telescope was crafted in wood and has a matching wooden observing chair. This, you got baffles in here? Yeah. Yes. So you do binocular white light observing? No, no, not white light. This those, isn't white light. Those are filters on there. Filters. Those are solar filters. Okay. All right. Solar Otherwise, filters. I'd go blind. Okay. And this is a parallelogram? No, yes, here? sir. It is. Oh, okay. Very cool. And did you build this parallelogram yourself? Yes, I did. It's oh, great, cool. great for star parties because kids can, you always know what the kid is looking at. Uh-huh. Sure. Very cool. I like it. I need to build one of these for my uh, binoculars. But <laughs> that's well, it's, a project. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper than buying one, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, they're expensive, aren't they? Yeah, they're a couple hundred bucks. I bet I don't have $20. The most expensive thing on this is the stainless steel hardware. Uh -huh. You know, the aluminum is cheap from... Most of us build out of scrap stuff from the neighborhood. Uh -huh. But the stainless steel was the most expensive thing. Uh -huh. If it ever comes out, you're welcome to look through it here. Okay. And these are, what, what, what power binoculars are these? These are uh, 10 by 70s. Uh -huh. 10, 10, by 10, 70s. 10 power, yeah. Seven, seven, as you, uh, you have binoculars and you're aware that the light gathering capability is the important thing, right. not the power. Right. I wish they were a little bit more powerful. Mm -hmm. I can see the Jupiter's moons without any trouble. I cannot see the I cannot not see the rings of Saturn uh -huh. with these. I can see Saturn's moon, Titan, but I can't see the rings. Right. And you need about I think about 20 power probably to see the mm -hmm. to see the uh, the rings. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I usually bring these out to star parties. I reserve the scope for when I go up north, you know, for for the not for the but for public awareness events I use these. Right. Because people are, are amazed uh, when they come out here what they can see. Right. The first year we ever did this was when Hale Bop was out. Are you recording this? Yes. This is must be right? awfully boring. Yes, yeah, all right. Uh, the I first, can edit it out. The first, first year we, we did this was when Hale Bop was out. And every, uh, we did it here. Oh. And uh, everybody walked 
by the binoculars. And then on the way out, they said, well, we might as well look through those. We've looked through everything else. And everybody, to a person, to a man, said, we should have come here and just stayed here. Because the field of view is so wide, you, you can see everything. Whereas in a scope, as you know, it narrows it down and you can't see anything. You can see the whole, uh, most most of the uh, the tail and, and, and the coma. And here we go, here we go. If I don't blind myself finding it. Here we go. Come and take a look, please, sir. And you'll see it's just poking. It looks like a moon rising is what it looks like. Okay. Come and take a look through this. All right. That's what we're here to do, sir. You don't have to bend over. You just raise the whole thing up. Grab it down below. And yeah, like that. Race it up to your company. Oh, I think. Oh, no, there it is. This is an 11-inch Celestron. 11-inch Celestron, okay. Yes, and it's, uh, in, what, what type of mount is this? Is this the... It's an equatorial mount. Let me okay. show you. I, I point this at the North Star, uh -huh. which is right up about there right now. Okay. And I know that because I've got a compass. Uh-huh. And it's set for the latitude where we are here in Michigan. So I point this at the North Star, and there's a motor driving here. Mm -hmm. And what this does is turn the whole telescope once every 24 hours. Okay. So it keeps up with the rotation of the Earth. If I didn't do that, I'd lose the target in about 30 seconds. Okay. Any target I'd have in here, I lose in about 30 seconds. So it's nice. It keeps, it keeps up with the rotation of the Earth. Milton, you got like many eyepieces here. What is this? Then, this is here? my, um, as of about six weeks ago, my latest edition. This wow. is, it's called a uh, turret. Wow. Uh, Paul Van Syke, I think is his name, out of uh, Boulder, Colorado, does it. I'm, I'm pleased with it. Really, uh, I'm not fooling around with eyepieces anymore at home, and I'm, I'm going out, I can set it because I've got it all stuck together. Right. I can just set this thing up, you know, and just look at, say, if I want to go look at one planet, take it in, five minutes, I'm done. You're looking at it through a very red filter with one angstrom of bandwidth. That means it's from 6,562 to 6,563 angstroms. It's very, very narrow. It's like the reddest and purest red filter you'll ever see. Hi everyone, this is Don Claser. I'm from the Detroit Science Center. We have our portable planetarium, Star Lab, with us here today and tomorrow at uh, Astronomy at the Beach.
we'd like to thank Greg Koneklian for putting together the video that you just saw. And if you have any questions about astronomy at the beach or anything else, send us an email to the address that you see down at the bottom of the screen. We'll be right back with the next part of Astronomy at the Beach 2011. Welcome back. As I mentioned earlier, I'm here in the studio with John Schroer. We're going to talk about this year's Astronomy at the Beach program. John, this is always a fascinating event out at uh, Kensington, and uh, you're on the planning committee for the, uh, for the event? Yes, I am, sir. Have been for the last seven years. That's uh, quite a long time. Before we get started with that, though, I understand we have a correction for our last show. Yeah, on the last show that we did, we talked about the bright star Vega, the brightest one in the summer sky. Don asked me a question concerning whether it was a double star or not, and it is not. It is a single star. Don meant to talk about the star Epsilon Lyrae, which is a double star in the constellation of uh, Lyra the Harp. So our apologies for that error in the show. Thanks, John. We want to be sure we get the facts just right. Now, what do we have coming up for uh, this year's Astronomy at the Beach? Well, this year's Astronomy at the Beach is going to feature as our keynote speaker, uh, David Eicher. He is the uh, editor-in-chief of Astronomy Magazine, which is um, one of the best-selling magazines in the world. And his topic will, um, is entitled, What's New in Our Universe? And he's going to talk to the, uh, the people that attend about some of the greatest discoveries we've made in the last 15 years, whether it's based on ground-based telescopes or the Hubble Space Telescope. And I understand, too, that we also have a number of other speakers besides our special guest speaker? That's correct. Um, other speakers are people who belong to either um, the astronomy clubs that put the event on, mm -hmm. or there are um, their sponsors, such as uh, Wayne State University has one of their physics professor talking about how hot space can be. Uh, we'll also have a talk about our vanishing night sky uh, by Professor Norb Vance over at Eastern Michigan University. And plus there are members such as John Blum, who belongs to both the, um, actually belongs to the Ford, Warren, and Oakland Astronomy Clubs. Uh, he'll be talking about basic equipment. How do you get started in astronomy? How do you shop for a pair of binoculars or a telescope? And there'll be vendors there that have equipment that folks can look at and would be available for purchase? Yes, they do. Um, those will include this year uh, Great Red Spot Astronomy Products. That's run by Jeff Heinlein. And we'll also have Camera Mart. Um, they're up near Pontiac off of Telegraph Road. And I understand, too, that uh, the Detroit Science Center will have their Star Lab Portable Planetarium to give tours of the night sky. Yes, they most certainly will. Um, they'll have their Star Lab, which they'll give a tour of what constellations their planets are up in the sky. Um, now, Astronomy at the Beach, um, 
when you arrive at Kensington Park, it's actually located in Maple Beach. When you arrive, you're going to see um, the, the banner, which uh, the crew will put up here in a second. And um, it will uh, show you the, um, some of the sponsors and let you know you've actually arrived at Astronomy at the Beach. Um, there are six clubs that uh, put this together. And the banner actually shows you some of the objects you'll be looking at. Uh, during daylight hours, we'll show the sun. In the evening, we will show things like the moon, the visible planets in the sky, um, nebulas, glowing clouds of gas and dust, star clusters, and the like. This is, of course, hoping that we have some clear nights. Well, our record for September has been remarkably uh, consistent and have supplying us with good weather. Um, in my seven years with the group, there's only been one weekend where we were totally rained out, and we still had over 4,000 people show up. Oh, that's great. Most certainly. Um, the next thing I'd like to show is all the, all the clubs, because this event would not happen without their assistance, and that includes the, of course, our club, the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, the Warren Astronomical Society, the Astronomy Club at Eastern Michigan University, um, the Lowbrow Astronomers from Ann Arbor, the Seven Ponds uh, Astronomy Club, located up at the Seven Ponds Nature Center, um, and the Oakland Amateur Astronomy Club. All right. Um, with those folks there, I'm sure we'll have plenty of telescopes out on the field. Absolutely. Um, there are usually anywhere between 60 and 100 or more telescopes on the field. Here you see an image of it during the uh, late afternoon, early evening, where people are setting up and the first set of visitors are arriving. And there are telescopes to let you look safely at the sun. Um, you can also see the moon. Uh, it's usually held around the first quarter, so you can look at that during the daytime as well as after it gets dark. All right, something uh, I think that most people really like to look for. I know when I've had folks look through my telescope, when they've seen the craters on the moon with their own eyes for the first time, they're in awe. They most certainly are. Now, sometimes uh, for kids, it can be a little bit of a problem once one of their parents gets a hold of a, of a telescope to look through. Uh, this is one of my favorites from uh, a couple of years ago. Um, this is properly captioned, come on, Dad. <laughs> Aptly so. Um, now, um, it's not just for families. There are also a lot of couples that come out and either they want to learn about astronomy as a hobby or they actually come out and let people look through their telescopes. For an example, here's our gracious host with his uh, better half with uh, his telescope. Indeed. Indeed. That was a good time that evening. Yeah, it was. Yes. Um, in addition, um, there are also um, there are, uh, parents that want to encourage their kids with these kind of scientific activities. Here's a shot of a dad working with his daughter. She has an interest in physics for to go into college and learn physics. So here is a uh, father and her, his daughter um, checking out the sky with their, their telescope. OK. And, uh we have, uh, as I said, couples, individuals, and uh, even families. That's correct. Um, we have another picture here that shows you a mom and a couple of her kids. And they're looking at the sun while the sun is still up in the sky. Uh, one of the nice things I like about the astronomy at the beach event is that, the, that we have a lot of things for kids to do. Um, the Science Center and other places bring make and take activities for the kids to do. Um, there is a children's sky scavenger hunt. They pick up a certificate and they go out and check out all the different telescopes that are marked by balloons. And they, if they get the complete list checked off and signed off by the astronomers, they can earn a prize. That's really great. It gives kids some incentive to uh, get out onto the field. It most certainly does. Um, now, a lot of people think it's all about um, telescopes. Um, and here, this is one of the stalwarts who comes out every year for astronomy at the beach. This is Bob Fitzgerald, and he is a binocular devotee. And here he is at sunset using his binoculars in which he lets people look through to uh, see the wonders of the night sky. Like he says, um, Bob insists that, you know, God gave us two eyes. We should be using both of them to observe. That is definitely Bob. Well, what else do we have uh, coming up then with astronomy at the beach for folks to come out and see? Well, besides the make and takes and the telescopes observing um, and the scavenger hunt for the kids, um, we also occasionally have a special event where people can get dressed up. 
Here's a shot from 2003 when Mars came closest to the Earth in like 50-some thousand years. So we invited all the kids to come dressed as Martians. And this is one of, these, uh, one of those shots of a bunch of Girl Scouts who had, uh, had taken up the cause. Mighty fine looking group of Martians. I would Looks like they're having a good time, too. Most certainly they are. Um, the last picture, we wanted to show some of the things that you can see besides the sun and the moon. And that is um, a beautiful group of stars called Omega Centauri. This is one of the largest globular or globe-shaped star clusters that you can see from the Earth. Um, it's located in the very low southern sky when we have the event. And it is, it's like looking at um, a beautiful, um, like 100,000 diamonds on black velvet. It's just a really beautiful thing to look at in the sky. Now, for the event itself, I mentioned that it's coming up on September 9th, which is a Friday, and September 10th, the Saturday. Uh, do you have any more particulars about uh, cost for the event and, and times? Sure. Uh, the event goes from 6 p.m., you can show up early if you like, until about midnight, unless something spectacular happens, which includes uh, a few years ago, we actually had northern lights near the end of Saturday night, which was something we weren't expecting. Um, so it's 6 p.m. to 12 a.m., Friday and Saturday. There's no cost to, uh, to attend the event. There is a $5 daily motor vehicle permit to drive into Kensington Metro Park. Um, like I said, this event starts at 6. It usually starts out there is a, a large trailer supplied by Metro Park, and we have astronomy movies playing in there throughout the night. 6.30, the first demo starts with comet making uh, done by the naturalist of Kensington Metro Park. Uh, the first actual presentation start at around 7 o'clock, and it includes a basic equipment talk. It talk there is a, um, a the vanishing sky talk, how light pollutioning is ruining our night sky. Mm -hmm. That's done by Norm Vance from the Eastern Michigan University Planetarium, which is about ready to open. Um, there is a presentation on basic equipment. That's by John Blum. There is a How Cold in Space, which will be done by John Potts, He's in the planetarium staff at the Detroit Science Center. And uh, how hot space is will be done by um, uh, Jerry from um, the physics department at uh, Wayne State University. Everything climaxes to 9 o'clock at night when David Eicher does his keynote presentation, What's New in Our Universe. Then afterwards, we do two tours at 9 and 10 o'clock at night of the nighttime sky. There will be several astronomers, including myself, that will have green laser pointers. And we will give people a tour of what planets and constellations and what bright stars are up in the sky. And then the field is open for general observation until we shut down around midnight. I know I enjoy going every year. I know uh, being at the Science Center, I'll be working in the Star Lab again this year. And so I always look forward to that, sort of give folks a primer of what they'll be able to see in the real nighttime sky. Are there any websites that people can visit to uh, find out more information? Absolutely. Um, the, we have a new website location this year, so if you want to check out um, more about Kensington Metro Park and about uh, astronomy at the beach, you can go to www.glaac.org slash Kensington, and that will take you directly to the site. You can see pictures of past events, past speakers, and shortly in the next week or two, you'll be able to download our flyer with all the information and a map on how to get to Maple Beach. Great, thanks John. We'll be back with Term of the Month. <music> Welcome to What's Up in the Night Sky for August 2011. The new moon for this month will actually happen on July the 30th. Six, seven days later, on August the 6th, we'll have the first quarter moon, which will be visible in the early evening sky shortly after sunset. The full moon will be on August the 13th, one day after the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, which means we're not going to have to work very hard to find some shooting stars up in the sky. The third quarter moon will be on August the 21st, at 5.54 p.m. Now for our planets. 
Uh, the first planet we'll talk about is Saturn. It is still in the evening sky. It's located low to the southwestern sky, just to the right of Spica. It's the bright star in the constellation of Virgo, a very beautiful blue star. Now, a close-up of Saturn, this is actually taken from the Cassini mission, looking back towards the Earth and the Sun. So this is a, a part of Saturn you'll never be able to see because you're looking on the far side of Saturn. The planet that's next on our list will be visible at about 2 a.m. in the middle of the month, and that will be the king of planets, Jupiter. Here you can see Jupiter in all its glory with the two belts near the equator. Uh, Jupiter will be in the constellation of Pisces, the fish. That will be in the southeastern sky around 2 a.m. in the middle of the month. The last planet that we can see in the sky will be in Gemini the Twins, and that's the red planet Mars. It will be visible at about 4 a.m., and you'll find it near the feet of Gemini the Twins, and also next to the bright star cluster M35. Venus will not be visible because it's now passing by the sun, not uh, going from a morning sky object to an evening sky object. The Perseid meteor shower, which I uh, talked about earlier, is uh, happening, and the peak is the 12th of August. With a nearly full moon in the night sky, you're going to have to work very hard to see some of the very brightest of the shooting stars as they, uh, they burn away in our atmosphere. Uh, of late breaking news, Vesta, which is the second biggest asteroid in the solar system, will be visible on August the 5th. It is in opposition, which means it's the best time to look for it. It's located, located excuse me, in the southwestern sky at 5 a.m. in the constellation of Capricornus. You will need a pair of, tele, uh, pair of binoculars or a telescope to see it because it is very faint, magnitude 5. Also with Vesta, NASA's Dawn spacecraft arrived there Friday, July the 17th, and is now in orbit. That's up, what's up with the night sky for August 2011. Thank you, and keep looking up.